2023. Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Smalley? Here. Vice President Hill? Here. Director Ackman? Here. Director Fulls? Here. Director Mayhood? Excuse me, I didn't. Enough. Director Mayhood? Here. Thank you. Okay. Um, any uh, additions or deletions to the uh, agenda? As staff has done, sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, oral communications. Uh, this portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by members of the public for any items that are not on the agenda uh, this evening that are within the jurisdiction of the district. Uh, does excuse me, were there any actions taken in closed session? I'm sorry, no, there were no actions taken. Thank you for that. Um, any members of the public uh wishing to address on an item that's not on the agenda? Yes, uh, please. Uh, uh, we ask you to use the mic and identify your identify yourself and location where, where you live. Yes, this will be. My name is Masood, Masood Hekiki, and uh, we have uh, uh, Boulder Brook Village in Prospect Avenue. And I know that you're making a tremendous improvement to the neighborhood in that area by having a new line that is going through the prospect into the, you know, that in the area of the uh, outer here. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. And morning. Morning and after year in that area that is uh, improving tremendously and um, actually one thing that uh, me and my wife were just like, uh, you know, very surprised is when we saw the fire hydrant in the corner of our property. And we were just so, so standing by because we were through the, the, the fire. And the fire came like, uh, you know, maybe 10 feet to uh, our cabins over there. So, and also our house. You know, we, we saved uh, we saved our house by uh, everybody. And I don't want to get into uh, too much of detail. I just want to say that we are very very happy uh, with the whole improvement. But uh, at the same time, I was a little bit disappointed uh, when I see that uh, you're going through Altavia and Monen and not Prospect itself, the upper portion. And I, I know I, I made a mistake. I should have been involved a little bit sooner in this whole process. But again, you know, when I talk to the people that are involved in this, I just was uh, kind of thinking it's just like going through this much of expenses and, you know, all these heavy equipments. And you actually missing the whole area that uh, the, the area that was affected by the fire and the houses were burned because we didn't have the fire hydrant in that area. So uh, I believe there are three, four, five structures that they were burned in the upper portion. And, and, and so I, I just walked through um, I, I just want to say I worked for San Carlos County for 26 years as a health inspector there. And uh, the last two years of my uh, working there, I was in charge of plan check review department and uh, doing a lot of stuff there. And I was just like, how could you just not see um, that the whole area would be covered. And then I walked through and I saw this house. The front of it was in uh, Monin and the back side of it was in Prospect. In, the address is one, two, 
Uh, well, what was it? That address? Let me just tell you the exact address. Um, it's I I one two. I'm oh, sorry, one one nine five five morning. So I will. Um, it's because it's not on the agenda. It's not something that we can discuss this evening. Okay. Um, okay. If you have question as to this, I think you could probably send an email to our uh, general manager. Um, I just want to just, uh, you know, just say that uh, we do have uh, three parcels over there. Right. And we, I mean, we are a good customer. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, we appreciate that. Yes, you could, you could make tremendous improvement by just going through someone's backyard and the whole area. Everything would be covered. Right. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on then. Uh, oh, okay. All right. And I neglected to remind folks that we do have a three minute limit, but yes, please, if you have something that's not on the agenda. My name is Richard Collier. I own property on West Park End. I rise to address the uh, question of the pump house that's going to be installed mostly on West Park and Ridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm here to request a noise study okay. by an independent consultant. The study should have four components. The first study, the first part of the study, should be a baseline study of what exists right now. All the pump houses in your district in that. Or near habitation, so that should be measured with calibrated noise meters done with the pumps on and the backup generators on, so we all get a, a feel for what's actually happening on the ground. That's the first step. Okay. The second would be a paper study that that compares the noise reducing qualities of the proposed building materials for the structure. And compares those to the calculated max noise generated by the pumps and the backup generators while they're running. Okay, this will answer the question: Is the noise being emitted below or at max thresholds set by state and local networks? That's the second step. The third step is: If this structure is built, that it set a follow-up real-time study using calibrated noise on all four sides of the structure. Done when the pumps are running and the generator is running to certain the real noise level and see how they compare to the right. That is my request. And finally, if this study is conducted, that all resulting data and reports be available, be made available to the public in a redacted form. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on just real quick, um, we are expecting the acoustic report from our engineering design team uh, that they uh, uh, are having consultants do. Uh, that report should be here Monday, and we plan to put that on the environmental and engineering committee uh, and to get that out to the public. Um, so I will, as soon as we get that, we'll make sure that you know, I, I believe I do have your email. And I will be able to send you that with the Environmental and Engineering Committee agenda for what's the date of that? It's on the 14th at 8.30 a.m. Okay, in this room to discuss that. Now, we haven't gotten to the consultant yet. They promised this to us uh, by Monday, and we have an agenda deadline Monday. So um, we can let you know uh, either way if it's going to make that agenda if we get it. But the report's already been commissioned uh, through our Consulting engineers to get that acoustic study done by acoustic engineering company. And does it involve any of the things I suggested? Or any? Does it involve any of the things I suggested? Uh, I know they went out and got baseline data of that. I, 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 I don't want to go into the, the details of what's what's in it. To to be to just hear what it was about. That's all. This is a pump station, new, a new proposed pump station on West Park Avenue. What was the date of the new uh, that you said? The, uh, the next meeting was going to be at 8 30 on the 14th this of September. September 14th, 08 14th in the morning at 8 30 a.m. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, concluding the oral communications, um, I do see a member of the public online, um, Alina Lang. Do you have a comment on something that's not on the agenda? <coughs> Alina? Sorry, I was waiting to be unmuted. I just wanted to say, I believe the E&E &E committee meeting is actually at 9 a.m. on the 14th. Oh, that's right. It's usually 8.30, but it's at 9 because it's a special meeting. Okay. That's all. So we can okay. have a cup of coffee with you before the meeting starts. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, seeing no other members of the public with comments now, we'd like to move on then to uh, new business. Uh, the first item is the uh, cost of service analysis and the rate design study. Rick? Yes, and uh, we have the finance manager here to speak to uh, Dallas and the site. Okay, so, so district staff have been working with Ralph Tellus on the 2023 rate study. Um, after providing the requested data and having multiple discussions about the district's goal, goals and feedback from the board and community, Ralph Tellus has prepared the following presentation uh, regarding the district's financial plan for the water and wastewater funds. Uh, the 10-year financial plan will ensure sufficient funds for operating debt service and capital program costs. The board is soliciting input from the community and the board regarding the different financial plan scenarios for the water and wastewater systems that we will see next. Um, this presentation will also be given at the September 14th special board of directors meeting to allow the opportunity for more members of the public to view the presentation and provide input. Um, so I will hand it over to Raf Tellis. We have Melissa Elliott, uh, Lindsay Roth, and Sudhir Pardwala here to present the financial plan. I'm going to present my screen first. I just like to. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. yes. <laughs> they're, they're adorable. <laughs> there we go. That's better? Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know. The other gets better. Good afternoon, President Smalley, members of the board. This is Sudhir Pardiwala with Raftaris. This thing is moving without my... What we are here today is uh, to present the results of the water and wastewater financial plan, which we've been working on for the last several months. And we have, as Kendra mentioned, we have Melissa Elliott, the project director, whom we have met before. Teresa, the project manager, is on vacation for the next couple of weeks and so she would not be is not able to attend and i'm filling in for her i you haven't met me before but i'm the technical reviewer uh i have over 40 years of experience and have worked with several hundred agencies in california or several hundred studies i should say in california and you've probably met lindsay as well who has been the lead consultant and done most of the an analytical work on this project Please feel free to ask any questions as I'm going up through. We don't have to wait till the end. And so I'm going to start the presentation now, the main presentation. Mm -hmm. We are here to discuss the financial plans. <clears throat> and since we are doing a multi-year plan, we need to make projections of expenses, revenues, capital projects, and so forth. I don't know why this thing is keeping moving. Uh, projections of all the expenses and revenues to ensure that we have reasonable estimates to project the different elements of the financial plan so we can come up with the appropriate revenue adjustments that we need to make to ensure the financial stability of the district. Inflation is one of the biggest issues that we have in terms of projecting the expenses. 
And so we will have a few slides on, you know, identifying what kind of inflation factors we are going to be using. The, we will look at some of the key inputs for both the water and the wastewater financial plans, identify what happens if we do not do anything, which is the status quo scenario, and then come up with the results of the financial plan. Yes, did I hear someone asking a question? No? No. Okay. Please, please continue. Okay. So let's start with the financial plan inflation in information. So look, we are looking at the results of inflation in the consumer price index in the San Francisco, Oakland, Hayward area here for the last eight years. As you can see, the inflation has been fairly consistent over several years, except in FY22 when it suddenly shot up and we are back down again in FY23. So this inflation had been used to project the, the expenses on the operation side. We are using an average of 3%, which is what we see basically in FY23. And this is typically what we use for long-term projections for expenses. So our general expenses and salaries will be inflated at 3% based on this particular chart. There are other elements of the operating costs which are more significant increases, and these are in fuels and utilities and in electricity. As you can see, these are pretty significant in 23 uh, for both of these elements. Uh, the fuel and utilities costs came down in 23, uh, but the what we are using an average of 6.5% on an average for the next five years to project both of these cost elements in our operations. So let's start with the financial plan for, uh, sorry, here's the uh, consumer price construction cost index, uh, engineering news record construction cost index, which is typically used to inflate the capital projects that are going to be constructed in future years. As you can see in this one as well, we had significant increases in 21 and also in 22, but the long-term average of the 10 years is about 4%. And that's what we would be using in, in our projecting our inflation expenses for the capital, cons capital costs. So let's start with the financial plan for water. Your water system, I think you should be familiar with it mostly. You have surface water intakes, wellheads, storage tanks, quite a few storage tanks, which primarily result maybe from the number of zones that you have, 36 zones. Yeah, which also are in you know have 30 booster pump stations also do for the same reason. Uh, we have two surface water treatment plants and about 190 miles of pipeline. Uh, our total sales water sales is about 1377 acre feet, which translates to about 600,000 cubic hundred cubic feet. Uh, typically, we refer to this as 600,000 units of water. Our revenues basically consist of about 85% from rates, which is fairly typical uh, of water agencies. 9% uh, comes from taxes and assessments, uh, and the remaining 6% from other sources such as interest income, non-operating income for other services that you might be providing and potentially some grants that might you might be receiving. Another important element of the financial plan is identifying the growth associated with the projection that we have, the five-year projections. So in our service area, we are looking essentially at eight accounts per year, except in FY24, when we have approximately 150 units from the Break and Bray and Forest Springs consolidation. Uh, and the demand that we are using uh, to make projections in the future are basically based on this increase in accounts. We do not change the actual usage per account, but just for the increase in accounts. The water usage, I, it's important to see what the water usage is going to be uh, going forward. And so we have put together this slide here that shows a historical use, water use uh, over the last several 10 years or so. 
And as, as we see in 15 and 16, because of the drought, we had significant cutbacks in usage, crept back up again in 17 and 18. And then last in FY22, again, we see a significant drop from uh, previous year. Uh, to be conservative, the two projections that we are showing for 23 and 24 and beyond, we will assume that it will be approximately the same as the usage in 22. This results primarily from conservation efforts. And there's a new bill in, in, in our state legislature right now that is going to be looking at even higher levels of conservation than what we have been seeing right now to account for the severe climate changes that we are seeing. Some of the issues that we'll be looking at in terms of the type of service and the levels of service that we want to provide, which is probably pretty common to other utilities as well, is replacing undersized and leaking mains. Uh, that is water that is lost basically from, and does not provide any revenue. So we want to reduce that water loss, improving the reliability in times of emergency, especially given the issues that are associated with fire service and fires that we have been experiencing in the area. And that also requires additional water storage to ensure that you have adequate water available to fight fires. This particular slide shows you our relative distribution of the different expenses that the district encounters. And this is the five-year average of your operating expenses. The main expense that you see here is the supply and treatment representing about 29%, followed very closely by the distribution system expenses of about 28%. And then the remaining expenses are shared by administrative engineering, watershed, and finance. So the bulk of your expenses are basically related to supply and the maintenance of the distribution system, representing almost 60% of your total costs. This is uh, not as common because you do not really have to purchase water. So you don't have as much cost in, in supply as some other agencies might have. Typically, those supply costs, supply and treatment costs can range between 50 and 70% of the total system cost. But in not your particular case, because you do not have any purchase supply costs, uh, you have the, the percentages for the other costs appear to be higher than what they should, would normally be for most other agencies. Uh, a significant aspect of the water financial plan is the CIP, the capital improvement program that the district has over the next several years. As you can see, the, in FY24, we have a significant expense. The total length of the bar represents the total CIP that the district will be encountering, and the different colors represent the financing associated with the capital improvement in any given year. Starting from the top, in FY24, we have the fire surcharge, which is constant at the current rates for the remaining five years. Then we have proceeds from the gray bar representing proceeds, which is this bar here representing proceeds from the the COP issue that we had, the certificates of participation, <laughs> the uh, revenue bonds that we had, or the $15 million loan, and existing monies that we have received from FEMA. Uh, we have grants represented by this bar over here, uh, new FEMA proceeds coming in, represented by this bar, and then the rate-funded CIP represented by the blue bar. So we can see that in FY24, we have a significant capital expense, almost $27 million, which begins to drop off each year and, and, and is funded by FEMA primarily here, here and here. Uh, and then as we get into FY28, we begin to see more of the rate revenue being used to fund the CIP projects. And so we have to make sure that our revenue program or the financial plan that we generate is adequate to fund all of the CIP as well as provide adequate funding for reserves and provide adequate debt coverage. 
an important element of the program also is to review what kind of fixed and variable expenses we have com and compare that to the fixed or variable revenues that we are collecting right now. So you can see because we don't have much by way of supply cost, purchase water costs, even the supply, most of your supply costs and treatment costs is essentially fixed. And therefore over 94% of your costs are essentially fixed costs. And this is again, based on a five-year average from FY 24 to 28. In terms of the revenue, the, the way we are collecting the revenue collectly, cur currently, we have about 37% that is collected from fixed charges and the remaining 63% is collected from variable rates. So you can see that the variable rates do include a significant component of your fixed cost. And anytime you have a reduction in your sales, obviously you're going to get impacted because you're not going to be adequately able to cover the fixed cost that the utility faces. Uh, another important element of the financial plan is to identify an appropriate level of reserves. And in this particular case, we are using the district's policy to identify what level of reserves we will need. And the we have three different or two different reserves here. One is the operations reserve, which is set at four and a half months of the operating budget, ONM budget. This results in a target of about $3.7 million. The capital improvements reserve is equivalent to two and a half percent of your replacement asset replacement cost. The which is estimated at $375 million. And, that, and therefore the target associated with the capital improvement reserve is approximately 9.4 million. In addition, we have a reserve for compensated absences, which is about one third the balance on the audited financials. And assuming that to be about $600,000 in FI24, that results in a target requirement of about $200,000 which is small compared to the main two reserves, which is the operation and the capital improvements reserve. Um, the district has faced some significant issues associated with fire, and we are now currently collecting a fire surcharge from all our customers based on the meter size. This is a restricted fund. The, the funds that we collect on fire services are restricted and can be only used for the CZU projects. The revenue to be collected currently is limited to $5 million based on the initial gr gross estimation of the net project costs for above ground pipelines. The fire surcharge would be collected through FY 2026, by which time we would have collected $5 million as originally projected. The CZU projects, however, will are expected to be completed only in FY 2028, and therefore the rates will have to bear some of the costs associated with the CZU projects. So let's look at the financial plans now. Uh, we have developed a couple of scenarios for the financial plan. And the different scenarios are basically having a the pipelines above ground or bearing the pipelines. So scenario one represents the above ground pipelines, which are primarily the P vine and the Clear Creek supply line. The cost associated with the CGU, CZU project cost is about $25 million for the next five years starting actually in 23 to 28, which is about six years. And we have a reasonable estimate that 90% of this, these costs will be covered by FEMA through a grant. So this is scenario one. That means that only 10% of the CZU project would need to be recovered from our rates and reserves. If we do not do anything, that is, we do not increase our rates our revenues, nor do we get any additional debt funding. Potentially, what we would be looking at is the reserves being way under, you'd be operating basically in the red. So in FY24, you would have a reserve of minus 2 million 
0.2 million, $200,000. And you can see that you are brought down to about minus $9 million in 25 and so forth as we go through the five-year program here. Uh, this is primarily because we still expect to get the grant funding from FEMA under, under this status quo scenario. So obviously we cannot, yeah, the, this line here represents the target and we can see we, our reserves do not meet the, tar the target that the district has established. So we definitely need to do something with our rates. This slide basically shows that to us that we need to increase our rates to make sure that we have adequate results to meet the district's policies. The other issue that we face as well is that we do not have adequate funds to meet our coverage requirements in FY26 and beyond. This line here, the blue line represents the target, which is 1.25. And this line here represents the actual coverage. That coverage basically is the net revenues, your operating revenues minus your operating expenses, and divide that by the debt service. So that represents, we are supposed to have a net revenue of 125% of the debt service. And, and as you can see, we don't meet that, tar we don't meet that criteria starting in FY26. What that would mean essentially is that we would be in default, technical default, and would reduce our ratings as well and help to or cause us to increase the any uh, debt issues that we have in the future to be at a much higher rate than would otherwise be required. So given this situation, we have developed a program of revenue adjustments to ensure that we have adequate revenues to meet the operating and capital expenses, provide for adequate reserves, and meet coverage. So under scenario one, where we are looking at the $25 million CZU project cost, we are projecting a 9% per year revenue adjustment every year. This also requires that we issue 15 million of debt in FY 2024. And we assume that this debt would be issued in early next year, calendar year, so that the first debt service payment does not occur until 2025. We are assuming that there would be no change in the fire surcharge. It would remain at the existing level and continue until 2026. And it would generate the $5 million that was originally projected. In the over the five years, we can see basically that this uh, the uh, reserves are slight, going above our target level here. But we have done actually a ten-year program, and we we would see that in subsequent years the reserves again are going to be drawn down. So this program essentially is preparing also for future capital expenses. Under scenario two, we have a buried pea vine and clear creek supply line. The project cost associated with this is about $52 million over the six years uh, and includes, the, as I said, the buried cost of, of the pea vine and clear creek line. Uh, in this particular case, since this has not been explored with FEMA completely yet, we don't know whether we would actually qualify for the 90% reimbursement. And also there are significant environmental concerns associated with bearing this pipeline. And I think if you need some more details on that, I think the general manager would have some be better idea as to the, some of the issues associated with these environmental concerns. Uh, so again, without doing anything, we would see some significant, this assumes again that we do get 90% FEMA grants, uh, but and so in terms of the additional expense that the district would incur, uh, we are looking at about $25 million, 10% uh, of the $25 million essentially. So two and a half million dollars over the five year period that would be an additional expense compared to scenario one. And so you would see these reserves are about at the end of five years would be about two and a half million dollars more than what we had in scenario one. 
But again, this assumes that you get 90% of your funding from FEMA, which is not guaranteed under this particular scenario, which is status quo, if we do not do anything with your revenue adjustments. Uh, the same issue with the coverage, we are going to fall below the target in FY26 and beyond, which is not acceptable. So looking at, again, at the proposed revenue adjustments, we are looking at about 9.5% per year revenue increase. We need to ensure that we have an adequate fund for the CIP. So instead of $15 million that we had in scenario one, we'd be looking at $17 million debt issue in, in FY24. Again, there is no change in the fire surcharge, and we keep the total revenue that we collect from fire surcharge at $5 million. So in this particular case, you would see that your reserves are slightly lower than we had in scenario one, uh, because we, we have a slightly higher expense associated with the larger project. Any questions on the, before I go on to the wastewater financial plan, any questions on water? Um, I request that you, uh, we, we have a lot of questions, <laughs> but I'd like to go ahead, uh, go ahead and have you finish first, and okay. then we can start the questions since I'm taking notes throughout. I have a number myself, but okay. please just go ahead and conclude the presentation and then we can go through with questions. Okay. Sounds good. So let's start with the financial plan for wastewater. Starting again with the wastewater system, you have a real small system serving only 56 residential customers and primarily consists of 2,600 lines of force mains and 3,600 uh, 2,600 feet of force mains and 3,600 feet of gravity sewers and a treatment system, which is a three-stage trickling filter system with clarifier tanks. Uh, obviously, for a system that is this small, you have pretty significant fixed expenses and pretty sure pretty high uh, rates associated with maintaining a system of this size. The last upgrades that were completed between 2005 and 2013, and the district is currently operating under a violation of the discharge permit that was issued in April 2016. Uh, the levels of service goals associated with the wastewater system include obviously the re regulatory requirements that drive ad ad additional cap capital needs and the existing collection system that needs improvement before it can be connected to the county service area seven. Uh, it's important, I think, from a long-term perspective to obviously connect these small number of customers to the county service area where they would actually s see some benefits uh, from merging with this bigger system. Uh, here is the expense summary associated with the wastewater system. Again, it's a really small system, total of $130,000 in expenses, the bulk of which is in, in contracts and professional services and salaries. Uh, while these percentages appear higher, high simply because it's such a small system, $130,000 overall. Uh, which it would be unusual to have such high costs associated with contracts and professional services typically. Uh, but because this is a small system, it represents a large, large, large percentage. Uh, the wastewater CIP, essentially, we see a big CIP in 2031. We do not have any expenses going in the next several years. Uh, we have a $2.6 million improvement associated with pipelines to be. Uh, completed so that we can merge with the county service area. It is hoped that we can get some grant funding for this, though we have not shown any grant funding, but we, you know, hopefully we do get some grant funding for this. Uh, so the financial plan right now is based on not having, assuming that there is no grant fund going to be available in the future. Um, the reserve targets are the same as we do for water, essentially 4.4 and a half months of your operating budget, which results in a target of $45,000, $45,700. And the capital improvement reserve is budgeted at 2.5% of the replacement cost, which is $3.4 million, which results in a target of $90,000. 
So the total that we need is about $135,000, $136,000 in reserves, which is shown by this black line over here. So if we do not do anything with the, our wastewater, uh, we do not make any changes to the rates, uh, no revenue adjustments, then as you can see, we, while we do meet our targets in these years, we have a significant drop off here in when we have to construct our pipeline in 2031. And so we have provided three scenarios in, in this financial plan. Uh, the first scenario, we assume that we have 50% grants and we incur debt of close to $1 million, which is about $900,000 here, three and a half percent for 20 years. Under this scenario, we are projecting that you would need rate increases of revenue adjustments of 8% in the first two years, followed by increases of 3% for each subsequent year. You can see that we are gradually building up our reserve here so that we can take care of the capital cost that we have in 2031. In the second situation here, we are looking at 50% grants and assuming that we do not issue any debt that we had over here. So in this particular case, if we do not issue any debt to ensure that we have adequate reserves to fund the CIP, we will need to do revenue adjustments of 15% for six year, or seven years actually, and then drop it down back to 0% after that. You can see you begin to build up reserves with these increases. Potentially, you could even have negative revenue adjustment at that point. You could drop your rates at that point, which is not an ideal scenario. Typically, you would not want to do something like that. So, uh, but it's an option that we have provided for your consideration. And finally, we are looking at the third scenario, which is an all cash, assuming that you do not have any grant funding. And in this particular case, you need to have seven years of 25% revenue adjustments, followed by 15% in 2031, and then drop down to zero, or you could probably go negative after that. So those are the different scenarios that we have provided for the financial plan. Um, that basically completes the presentation for the financial plans. The next thing that we really need to do is to identify what scenarios we want to pursue in developing the financial plan and make adjustments as needed to meet your requirements. Select the appropriate CZU project scenario, whether it's going to be $25 million above ground pipelines or underground $52 million in underground lines and then develop the rates based on cost of service analysis for both your water and wastewater. Look at any potential changes to the rate structure and, on, and look at alternative water rate structures as well. So that basically completes my presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll review the project schedule. Uh, the last slide is the project schedule. And the idea is that we would have discussion with staff on the rates based on our meeting today by September 28th, uh, have another discussion with the board, identify on October 5th, prepare a draft report by the 19th, conduct public outreach in October, November, prepare a final report by November 20th, uh, have board discussion on December 7th to get approval for the 218 notice, and then mail the notices out, have the public hearing in January for implementation of your rates on February 1st, 2024. So now with that, we are open to questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Um, for the general public, uh, we start questions uh, from the board level first. And then after the board goes through and asks uh, pertinent questions, we'll open it up to the public um, for uh, questions and comments. So 
Um, I'd like to start with. May we ask a question? Could, is there any chance that we can get a copy of that? That study. Mm -hmm. This will be posted to the website after tonight's meeting. This uh, presentation. We can send Thank one you. out to Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So I'd like to start uh, with a uh, member of the board who's on the budget finance committee who is here this evening, uh, Jeff Hill. Okay, so having been on the budget and finance committee, I've actually spent a lot of time looking at these numbers for the past couple of months. And so I don't have a whole lot of questions about them, but um, I, I think it's, it's important that we all recognize that it's not business as usual because we have this big overhead looming to fix the fire damage that we had to our main supply lines uh, of either, depending on which scenario, 25 million or 52, maybe more than that, hard to say, uh, by the time we get it all bid and everything. And that's affecting us quite, a, going to affect our financial numbers quite a bit going forward. And, and I think that, that makes this a more difficult discussion but we don't really have much choice from what I see, uh, but to rebuild those lines. And uh, it's just a matter of time before we would have serious problems if we don't. So um, that's kind of where I am on it. Uh, we would sort of the devil in the deep blue sea here. So I don't really have a question on this. Okay. Okay. I, I just a comment, because like I said, I've been looking at these numbers for, right. okay. for weeks now. Um, and one of our board members is participating remotely this evening, who's also on the Budget and Finance Committee, um, that's Gail Mayhood. Um, I'd like to open it up at this point to Gail for any comment or question uh, on this. No, thank you, Mark. I'm, I mean, I think that this lays out um, <laughs> how dire our circumstances are. Um, and, and this really comes from both the fact that we've um, had to deal with the impact of the fire and now the um, perhaps $5 million of damage from the storms of 2022-23. But we're, we're also, um, in, in part, one of the reasons we're in bad shape in terms of reserves is that we've essentially sort of uh, went without um, increases for the last couple of years because we uh, went with the rate study um, and what was passed in 2017. And so this leads to, um, so in a sense, what's happened is that our rates have actually not kept up with inflation. And we know that inflation has actually been pretty ferocious in the last year. So this really gets to a question that I kind of have in a general way, and maybe some of the public would have too, is, the number of 9% or 9.5% is is out there and it's a continual number um, for the next five years. And I don't know if you had put up a 10 year plan, whether that would have continued, but how did you arrive at that number? And why would we not, for example, think that maybe what we need is some kind of a catch-up situation where we make up for the last two years where we didn't um, have rate increases, and then catching up the value of that is that it would help with our reserve position, um, and and then perhaps not have as high rates uh, rate increases down down the road. So that's my first question. And then, then I have some questions about some of the assumptions that you made about inflation and other things, but those are kind of more nitpicky. <laughs> um, well, they're important, but but they're in the details. So maybe you could answer my first question first, and then I'll hand it over to other people to ask questions. So one of the things that we look at when we are developing the financial plan is to try to have steady increases, first of all, yeah? So when you do look at, actually, I'm going to share my presentation again. If you look at our, you can see that even with the 9.5%, we are falling below target. Uh, can you see my screen? 
Not yet. Coming up. It's coming. There you go. Yeah, we even with the nine and a half percent increase, we are not meeting the target in 2025. So if you were try to if you were to try to meet this target, we would need to have higher rate increases than the nine percent that we projected here. This is under the first scenario where we're looking at the $25 million cost associated with the CCU project. Our idea typically is to have increases that are relatively constant, so we don't go up and down with the, with the rates. Uh, if we were to try to meet the target here, we would actually need to do a higher revenue adjustment than the 9% that we are proposing. That's, and, actually not, that's not my question. Okay, I, what, what I, because um, I think it's perfectly understandable, frankly, that given all the, the, the hits we've had with uh, the fire and um, the storm damage, that we can't expect to dig ourselves out of the reserve hole while we're doing all of that. And I think we have to be a realistic that it may take us three or four or five years to um, meet what the ideal reserves uh, would be. Um, but my question is, is, you said that it's better to have year after year the same percentage increase. And I guess I don't really understand why. I can see why you don't want to go up and back down again, but I, I don't quite understand what the reasoning is, why you'd want 9% or any percentage per year going out. The, it, well, it is... Uh, we we could have higher increases if you would like, you know. But uh, and the thing is, it has a significant impact immediately on your customers. So the idea is to minimize the impacts on customers instead of having a twenty percent increase, for example, and then leveling off at five percent or three percent per year. If you do a big increase right up up front, you're going to have significantly more impact on your customers. Right. So generally, you want to try to have increases that are fairly consistent over time. And and we can we can explore that scenario if if required. I mean, I, I can show you what happens if you do that. You know, what kind of adjustments you would need subsequently if you had a much higher increase in that first year to be able to meet this target in this year, then your increases in the subsequent subsequent years would drop off. But but that's not typically how most agencies want to handle their uh, revenue adjustments. Generally, they want to have even increases so that the impacts on customers are moderated every year as opposed to you know a big jump in one year. But that's an option that you do have if you decide that's what you want to do. Yeah, I, I, I just was, it was just that I didn't understand the principle, but you've explained it to me now. I think, I think however, I guess I would say that I think that our ratepayers understand that we have sort of extraordinary circumstances right now. And, um, what I'm worried about is that if we're out at year five or six and the inflation rate's only 2% and we still have to, and we're asking for a 9% increase, that, that that's going to kick up some uh, unhappiness as well. So, e you know, either way, we could potentially run into um, resistance. And and I guess it's worth, that's that's why we're doing this in public, so that the public can kind of weigh in on how they feel about it, too. But yeah. thank you for your explanation. I, I understand better now. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Mark, uh, I may have more questions, but let me, you know, go go let another board member speak. Okay, you have additional questions. We'll come back then. Okay. Uh Bob, why don't you take a shot at a couple and well, we'll, I have, keep, we'll keep going. Yeah, right. I have a lot. So I'll, we can cover them in tranches if that's what you want uh, to do. That's right. what I'm proposing at this point, yes. Okay. Um, when was the last rate increase that we had? Was it November 2021? So typically the increases would go for the effective for a full year. So the next increase would have been November of 2022 if we had stayed on the same cadence. So we're really only one coming up on one full year where we haven't had a uh, been under an effective rate increase. Right? Is that right? Correct. And I think in general, what the district has done in the past is it's not entertained rate increases during an election year. At least that's been the historic um, because the last two were 2013 and 2017. Um, I think, you know, just to be a little cynical about it, uh, the big increase is what gets people's attention 
for the Prop 218 process. And since the Prop 218 process is this backwards vote, it's kind of a, from my perspective, an anti-democratic process where you vote against the rate increase. You but, don't vote for it. But and that's what you don't want. That's that's what he's saying is that by having a big increase mm -hmm. like we did in 2017, okay. that gets people's attention. And in 2017, the protest vote didn't succeed, but it was over 20, over 2,000 raw votes came in. And that's because it was a 35% increase in that one year, right? So that's being cynical about it. it the reason they want it lower and steady is so you don't get people's attention uh, and vote for it um, or vote against it rather, because you don't actually vote for it. Um, one of the other things I'm concerned about here is that we're conflating numbers. So we haven't had a real clear distinction here between operating and capital. Those are two very different buckets. Anybody that's run a business knows, um, or even maintaining your house, knows you've got expenses uh, to run your business and you've got capital expenses. This presentation did not cover that distinction at all, other than talking about what the revenue increase would be per year. And let's just keep in mind, that a 10% increase per year means your bill doubles in seven years. That's, that's the power of compounding or the negative effect of compounding. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we're communicating that in, in those ways. Um, for example, what is the operating margin per year that we're talking about here for both operating and, and non-operating um, uh, expenses? None of that was covered tonight. So the big question is, when do we see the numbers? Unfortunately, the devil is in the details when we start talking about budgets and numbers. When are those spreadsheets going to be available? I can't, I can't make any evaluation of this budget in any substantive fashion without being able to look at the numbers and the formulas, if the numbers have a lot of formulas embedded in them. I don't know how anybody could do that sitting on a board. We, we have provided the model to the staff, so you should be able to see the numbers if you so desire, yeah. When can we have that distributed to the board and even made available to the public? I'm talking about complete transparency here, folks. If we're doing anything other than complete transparency, we're not doing our job, in my opinion. So, Rick, Kendra, questions being posed here. I'm not sure we have everything. Okay. We'll look into it. And if we have, of course, the board is welcome, the finance committee is okay. welcome, and the public is welcome. We've, okay. we've been over the model with consultants, um, but we haven't actually been sent the model yet. Sudiers, I don't know. Okay. And I, I have been on vacation, so maybe you have sent it since then, but... Um, uh, I apologize. I thought that uh, that model had been shared with you, Kendra. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So of course, if we have any documentation, right. okay. of yeah. course, it will get to budget, finance, and the board, and the public. Mm -hmm. Well, that hasn't been the case in the past with the rate increases, so I'm glad to hear that we're doing that this time. Mm -hmm. Last question for this tranche. Um, uh, has to do with making sure I understand what was being shown on these slides with respect to the reserves. Were the reserve numbers have shown a combination of debt financing and operating margin or just operating margin? The reserves include the debt financing as well. Without debt financing in the reserves, you would not, yeah, they would not meet the target, yeah. Okay, so that's what I call phantom reserves. Because our policy today is that whenever we take out a debt tranche, and typically to get the low interest rate, you have to make sure that you're spending that money within a set period of time on projects related to the district. You can't use it as sort of general purpose, kind of if another flood or fire or disaster happens. So by conflating those two numbers, you're giving a wildly inaccurate picture of what our true reserve position is. If I take some of those numbers and subtract out the debt, 
we're sitting at a reserve level of about 2 million. That is half of what we had when the fire came through and we almost ran out of cash because we only had 4 million. Mm -hmm. We came very close to running out of cash because we only had 4 million in reserve, real reserve, not phantom reserves for stuff that's applied elsewhere. We had debt funding to do that, but that debt funding was allocated to other projects. So I'm really concerned about the fact that the presentation also does a conflation of numbers in a way that does not provide a clear, transparent indication of our district's true financial condition. And with that, I'll pass on to, I guess it would be Jamie that would be well, next. I would like to hear Sudair respond to that. Yes, same here. Yeah. It is, the idea basically is that you have this cash available to meet your capital expenses. And so once those funds are used up, you can see what the reserve levels are essentially. So you do have that cash available to meet your expenses. And the, the this is typically how we look at, you know, your if you did not use your the, the debt that the funds from the debt in the reserves, then you would be looking at much higher revenue adjustments. And then the question is, why would you need to have any debt at all? You would be looking at high revenue adjustments. Uh, you would not need any debt. But but the problem with that is, is that what happens is, again, you're hiding what's happening on the operating expense side. Because if, in fact, we're looking at only having $2 million in reserves, and most of that money is coming from debt, that means to me that the rate increase is almost being completely consumed by increases in operating expenses. Historically, our operating expenses have gone up at almost three times inflation. And if we're continuing down that path, that means more of this rate increase is going to operating and not to where it should be going, which is capital. And we can't tell that because the numbers aren't broken out. I think we really need to I think so too. And I'd be happy to do that as soon as I get it. In fact, I'm eager to do that. So, um, Sudhir, is it uh, appropriate to look at reserves both ways? Is that? That is not typical for us. We basically, you know, we look at revenues, all the revenues, including the debt as, you know, yeah. one, one bucket of money and make sure that the district has enough funds to be able to operate appropriately, provide enough money for your capital expenses provide adequate coverage and have enough money in the reserves. That when you issue a debt, you have that money available for you to be able to use for your capital expenses. So what we've done in the past is when we've done a, when we've done a tranche, a debt tranche, we have passed a resolution mm -hmm. that says this money is going to these projects. So the community knows that we're not taking that money and shuffling it around somewhere else. That's complete transparency. So to say that you can take that debt tranche, that tr debt money, and use it for whatever else you want other than specific projects is not in line with what we've done with the last two debt tranches. And I would absolutely oppose any debt financing that does not continue to offer that level of transparency. So I think it's appropriate, Jeff, yes. for the committee to have further discussions yes. with uh, Oh, with Ref, tell us about this issue. Well, they're going to tell you this is the way that it's done everywhere. I uh, well, understand that, it, but I right? understand your point also, Bob. We'll that take a look if at it. If the district made a commitment to the community that that's where this ten million was going to be spent on these four water tanks, well, we only got three done because we needed uh, two and a half million to go do all of the repairs on the. So, uh, so they've conflated the expenditures also, though. Oh, of course. Yeah, they've yeah. completed both the sources of cash and the expenses. Absolutely. It is and completely non-transparent. Is okay. It is completely non-transparent in terms of what's been presented tonight. So, um, the model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll have so more later. Further, further questions, Jamie? Um, so, 
going back to the pie chart that showed the variable versus um, fixed expenses, um, I, I want to say it was like 94% um, fixed expenses. Can you tell us more about what is categorized as a fixed expense? Yeah, so when you look at this pie chart here, which shows all the different expenses that you have, these are pretty clear that these are fixed costs, essentially. Yeah? These four elements are fixed costs. Generally, we would look at supply costs as also being variable. But in your cases, the supply cost is basically labor. You know, most of it is salaries. The only variable here is chemicals. And that's why we are looking at about 94% of your cost being fixed and just a very small percentage, 6% being variable. That depend, the variable costs depend upon the amount of quantity of water that the district is actually processing through right. the treatment plant. So to clarify, and, what you're saying is that 94% of our district costs are fixed to us, meaning we have no control over them. We couldn't cut them without cutting water service or you know, eliminating the ability to serve a community. Is that accurate? That's right. Okay. So we have 6% to work with in terms of our ability to um, make, you know, in terms of our ability as a board to make variable decisions about how the budget is structured. That's right. right. Okay. Um, going to uh, my next question, you, you said that in your scenario one, you were proposing a 9% um, average annual rate of increase. And first, I, I wanted to respond to the idea that, you know, somehow having a, a steady rate of increases, hiding something or trying to, um, you know, create some kind of lack of transparency about the cost, um, you know, putting everything up front would be a very significant uh, increase all at once for people to absorb immediately in their budget. And a 9% increase, while I understand, would not be something that, that you know, people on a fixed income would be, or, or anyone would be able to like easily absorb if you know that you have to plan for a 9% increase every year, as opposed to next year, you're going to have a 35% increase you can budget differently. So I kind of, I, I object to the idea that smoothing that rate increase is anything but uh, you know the, the right thing to do if we do decide to apply it. But that being said, that 9%, I wonder if we could put some context around that. Kendra, what's our average um, monthly bill? Um, it's about, for four units of water, it's Ninety-five dollars. There you go. So we're so the average user at a nine percent increase would be looking at you know a roughly nine dollar increase in their bill, eight dollar increase in their bill if we were to implement this. Mm -hmm. um, that's all my questions for now. Thanks. Okay, um, I wanted to follow up also on the fixed versus the variable slide. Um, so, dear, you're you're showing us this. But I don't see any uh, uh, a, a next step. And, and based on this, uh, what we see with if we have uh, fixed expenses, and I believe that that includes that includes salaries also. And unless we uh, significantly reduce our staff, we can't we can't significantly reduce our expenses. But our revenues are. Um, fixed of only 37%. So what's um, your thought or recommendation on where to go with this, what I consider imbalance between how our expenses are covered versus our revenues? Okay. Uh so this there is a fine balance as to how we how much we should collect from fixed charges versus variable rates yeah mm -hmm. the issue that comes up is the ideally you would like to collect all of your fixed costs from fixed charges the problem with that is that small customers typically which are senior citizens low maybe low income customers those are the ones that are using very minimal water would wind up with huge bills and that is the reason why there is a you know 
typically in in almost all cases you will never find all of the fixed costs being recovered from fixed charges the california urban water conservation council was recommending that the fixed charges should not exceed 30% they have gone away from that now because of the drought and so forth but that was primarily to make sure that the commodity rates or the variable rates stay high enough to promote conservation as well so there are several factors that have to be balanced to ensure that this fixed variable revenue remains reasonable to provide incentives for conservation as well as minimize the impacts on small volume customers that would be unduly impacted by high fixed charges does that help you so shifting uh more of our rate to fixed versus variable as it is right now um uh, is acceptable if that's what the district decides to do because what i see uh is as we continued to conserve over the last several years the um uh, great we're conserving but then the the revenue on the variable continues to go down, continues to go down. So we've, we're not balancing that out. So I, I think one way to look at this is say, say we, for simplicity's sake, we sell a hundred gallons of water. If we only sold 90, it wouldn't save us any money at all on our end based on that, because the percentage of the cost of that water, the cost of us to provide it, that is the actual gallons of water is very small. It's the, it's the cost of electricity to run the pumps and some chemicals to, right. to uh, uh, treat it. And um, I'm, I'm not, this, I'm not going down the, to trying to, to yeah. characterize that for the public at this point but just simply and i'm not uh advocating or thinking that we would be going anywhere near attempting to collect 90 percent in fixed revenues but somewhere uh above the 37 percent sudir you said that the state had some restrictions uh previously at 30 percent but they've now removed that completely or changed yes. that Yes, they don't have that. That used to be the California Urban Water Conservation Council. It was a recommendation. It's oh, wow. not, it not a requirement. Mm -hmm. the, we haven't yet done the rates per se. So we do have flexibility in terms of how much you want to collect from your fixed charges. This 37% mm -hmm. is what you are currently collecting from your current rates. It's not what we are proposing here. Right. So okay. You haven't done that yet. So if you want to see a higher percentage of your revenues to be collected from fixed charges, we can certainly do that. And it would be consistent with the the rate the uh, cost structure that we have right now. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, l let me finish on that then. And what are you seeing other districts do? Generally, on, on yeah, this? Gen generally, as you see, first of all, we have, you know, having 94% of your cost from fixed is very unique. There are very, probably very few cost utilities that have right. that much in fixed costs. Most utilities are in the range of 50%. You know, they have because they're buying water, expensive water. Right. It could be anywhere between 30 and 50% of their variable being variable costs uh, uh, and the remaining being fixed. In our case, you know, we are looking at 94% fixed. So that's a very high fixed right. cost associated with your, okay. with your operations. Um, and in so in that in most cases we are in uh, here we're looking at about twenty five to thirty percent in uh, in uh, the fixed revenue collection. Agencies that have lower purchase water costs tend to go a little bit higher, maybe go up as high as forty or in the low forties, you know. But generally, that's about as high as we typically go for the fixed charges. Okay, so agencies that are purchasing a lot of water. Uh, are at that, uh, right. but uh, are you saying that we're a fairly unique agency in the fact that uh, we don't purchase 
much of any, and that's why we have such a high fixed cost. That's right. Also, okay. you're, you're, yeah, you're not pumping groundwater, yeah. which would also right. consume, you know, would be a variable expense. But in, in our yeah. case, we are drawing mostly surface water. And so yeah. 50, there 50. as well, we are not incurring any addition. Too much we still have to pump costs. surface water. Um, we, we don't use just surface water. We're at about a 50-50 balance, but we don't purchase water from an outside entity such as uh not buying it from Santa water. Cruz or oh, right. Okay, but I, I gotta I gotta challenge this notion of 94% fixed cost. I mean, under an accounting definition, that is not true. And even under an operational definition, I gotta challenge this. Let me just give you an example. We had a gentleman working for us who did probably the most thankless job uh, that we used to have here, which is dealing with uh, turnoffs, tagging, that sort of thing. We changed our policy to get rid of all that. The, the, the gentleman was up for retirement anyway. He retired. That would have been a savings that would have been a no-brainer. And yet we didn't reduce headcount. So, so the function went away. I can't tell you where that headcount is gone, what's happening. But what I can tell you is over the last, since 2013, our operating expenses have gone up by almost double and inflation's gone up 27% in that time period of which 8% of that was last year. I, so to say that we have 94% fixed cost assumes that you do nothing to make your operations more efficient. You don't use technology. You don't look for different ways of doing things. You don't do all the things that normal operations do. And instead you just say, well, we can't do anything about it. So it's, we're just gonna consider it a fixed cost. That is completely counter to what we need to be doing for our community. And by the way, the board didn't challenge that headcount. Uh, reduction, it basically said, oh, no, nope, we'll just continue having that headcount in there. And a perfect opportunity to reduce costs, and we chose not to do it. I didn't choose that, by the way, but the board did. Um, so uh, I, I, we, we, I, I, we cannot accept that on face value without price. really understanding what's yeah. underneath those numbers. Um, I don't want to uh, say that we're falsifying something here by saying that that these fixed costs are not um the correct that we're showing here can i ask a question sure so i was the director of communications for san jose water these are entirely consistent fixed and variable costs with every other water system that i've dealt with in the bay area and i do have some particular expertise in dealing with these kinds of questions so i appreciate that bob feels based on his private sector budgeting, that, that these are not fixed costs. Um, but I would ask Sudair, is that pretty consistent with the rest of the water industry in terms of fixed versus variable costs? Yes, when we look at salaries, we, I mean, this, we, are, we are providing you these estimates based on the budget that we have right now. If you were to reduce your workforce, yes, that would cause the obviously the fixed cost to come down. Right. But this is based on your current budget, based on your current salaries, benefits, and so forth. Right. But the so, question that I'm asking is, Sudhir, when you compare our fixed costs to other water systems that you deal with, would you say that our fixed costs, while higher because we provide all of our own water and do not purchase it, are fairly consistent with other systems? That's right. If you were to... As I mentioned, typically when we look at water production costs, whether it be from wells and our purchases, we would be looking in the range of, you know, as I said, 30 to 50 percent of the total cost of a utility would be the cost of water. Thank you. Okay. So it, it seems to me that at the crux of this is that on the one hand, there are things that are fixed costs that perhaps we could do things about saving money on, which is what Bob well, is saying. The, the definition for those is either semi-variable or semi-fixed. Well, in a, in a true accounting sense, yes. Right. But on the other hand, from what we're looking at here is, let's say we had a 10% increase in water sales. That would not necessarily no. move this our fixed costs or a 10% reduction. 
either way. No, our marginal costs for the next gallon of water are very is, low. Yes, no, no, no question about that's it. That's the point that he's making, trying no, to make but, here. But that's a different point than what he's saying here. <laughs> without looking at the numbers, I mean, let's let's be let, let's be really clear. The last staffing study we had done, uh, which we'll cover next, but just as an advance of that, basically increased our staff by fifty yeah. percent. I can't tell you operationally what we get for that, but what I can tell you is our operating costs have doubled over that time, in large part because of that staffing study. So, and but, that, but and 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 we're delivering less water. That's a cost savings question, uh, but it's not necessarily a relationship between the amount of water and the. And, and the, and the, we uh, we should be able to tell expense. we should be able to right. tell people what they're getting for their rates having gone up 140 percent in the last 10 years. Other than um, just hey, I, you get you get I'm, four I'm, units of water. Well, yes, yeah, but, but that, it's two, we're, talking we're talking about two different things here. <laughs> um, but this right. is all I, this all folds into whether or not the community should support whatever it is that the. Board yeah. is going to bring to them for a Prop 218 yes. process mm -hmm. during the holidays, by the way, which I find unconscionable. Uh, right. So, so we'll we'll continue. I'd like to give uh, Director Mayhood a chance to comment further, since I've seen she's had her hand up for a bit and I'm is not ready for it because we're getting badly off track. Um, and I think everybody knows that in the utilities like this, what we're, when we're talking about fixed, of course, it's not absolutely fixed. You can add more people, you can subtract more people. But the point is, is that the uh, that your costs do not change if you sell, as Jeff said, 10% more water. And so in that sense, there's the variable and the fix and everybody understands that. So let's not waste a lot of time, you know, sort of getting into this semantics about about this. We, we need to be focused tonight on what we're being presented here, which is essentially a budget. It, it is not the rate study itself. In other words, that's what comes next, right? And so I think Sudhir was trying to explain that, that uh, you know whether we wanna go with a higher proportion of our uh, revenue coming from a fixed basic charge is something that I think we've probably all expressed that we want to move in that direction and they can do some modeling to help us understand it. But I think it's important to also remember that you can't talk about changing the proportion of variable versus fixed without also bringing in the issue of tiered rates, which is another thing that would be discussed in the next round when they start to come up with a rate study. Because if you're, as Sudhir was saying, if you worry about really raising the basic charge, that has the biggest hit on lower income or fixed income people. But if you have tiered rates where the first uh, you know, amount of water that you use is at a fairly low rate, you combine those two, you can mitigate that. So there are various ways to work on that, but that's really not what we should be talking about tonight or Bob talking about, um, as he often does, about how operating costs are going up. We should be asking questions um, about the model that we have here and trying to understand the model and get it discussed enough that members of the public can ask questions about it. So I just wanna bring us back to the fact that this is essentially a revenue budget. And we, we, don't, we don't have a model or budget that's been presented. We have that, a very high your, level that model. Is, okay, that is your opinion, Bob, but I think I, I, what we have I, in front of us. All, all of the all of the directors have had chance to comment or ask some questions at this point, um, or at least a first tranche. Um, I'd like to open it up to the public now uh, to see what questions they may have. Um, and uh, again, I'll remind folks of a three minute limit. Uh, we'll start with uh, folks here in the audience. Uh, and then I'll move to virtual. So, please. Hi, I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about this debt, uh, this debt in early 2024. It sounds, um, well, what I remember was uh, 
the district borrowed about $15 million four years ago. And I don't think it's been spent yet. Um, then a year and a half later, in early 2021, the district borrowed $14 million. And I don't think that money has been spent yet either. Uh, and for a long time, we were losing money because the amount of interest we were paying on the long-term debt was more than we were getting on the cash balance uh, in the county treasury. In fact, I, I figured that we lost about $2 million on the interest rate differential before the district began uh, reinvesting uh, outside the county uh, investment pool. Um, so so I'm, I'm concerned that we, we, we haven't even spent the money that we already borrowed and it's been years. And so I'm concerned if there's this eagerness to go out and borrow more. I mean, I know there's big expenses here, but I guess I just want to make sure that we're going to spend the money on real capital improvements and not just leave it in the county treasury for years and years. Um, I mean, it's been four years since that first time it has not been spent. Yeah, is that correct? That is correct, right? The 50 million is still not completely spent. Not uh, completely a new project. Okay, it's been four years. It's been spent down. Uh, um, okay, so I'm, I'm concerned about uh, more debt all of a sudden. Uh, because you can't, it doesn't seem like you can spend it. You've been able to spend the debt that you already have. Um, this thing about the fixed and variable costs. Uh, when I get my PG&E bill, there's no basic rate at all. So there's a utility that somehow, I mean, I know they've got fixed costs too, but they don't charge it to me. They don't charge me unless I use a kilowatt hour uh, at all. There is no basic rate at all <laughs> in the PG&E bill that I can see. So I'm a little bit, and if I think about all the businesses up and down the street here, um, there is not one business here that says, oh, you got to pay this uh, this basic rate and then you can, then you can uh, buy our product. The gas station, I mean, I saw the gas station was ripped up for months last year because they were putting in uh, new tanks underground. And so I know they've got a capital expense, they've got some kind of cost because of that capital improvement that they made. But when I go to buy gas, they don't say, oh, you got to pay the $500 a year basic rate first, and then we'll sell you all the gasoline you want at $2 a gallon instead of $5 a gallon. That's not the way it works. So I don't see that this, I don't see that it happens elsewhere um, in the economy. Okay. Thank you. Um, other members of the public? Getting harder and harder at 86. <laughs> Hey, Bob, I was listening to yours and I. I'm sorry, could you identify yourself, please? What do you want me to do? Your name and where you live. You're just Orville your town. Hunted, Bear Creek Estates, uh, Boulder Creek, California, 95006 for all of our insurance doubles. <laughs> That's me. Uh, I've been here 50 years. I've worked with gentlemen in here and certainly not some of them. Uh, Bob, that, those numbers, though, I, I was confused by some of the numbers that he put out also. And were those numbers weighted with the fire and with the storms and all? If they weren't weighted, uh, how in the hell is he going to come out with a number on this study? I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay, I can respond. Uh, sorry, Bob. I heard what you said. I believe I, you. Um, I... I um, I think the the question that you're asking, we should be putting to um, our presenter. Um, and I'm not I thought sure. I could ask Bob if I well, to. I, I'm not sure Can what you. Ask the chair first. Um, I, I can't answer your question. Um, it's the presentation that we've been uh, shown tonight that they're asking. I can, We're asking for comments. I, asking I can answer it. It, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was adjusted to remove CZU. You um, didn't mention it. I wasn't sure. Yeah, it was adjusted. Uh, the, uh, the, I, I didn't also understand the loss of revenue 
Uh, first of all, actually, if we can get it on the line, then we can study the numbers a little more. That was a lot open to us real quick, and you've had it for months. <laughs> uh, just tonight. No, some of us are saying it for, for the first, first time, time tonight also. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't help that. I mean, somebody said they've had it for a couple of months. Well, um, the, the, it, it will be it will be shared. Oh, yeah, it will be it shared. Will be shared. Uh, so, it was yeah, I, I have seen preliminary versions of this right. and, and that stuff. But so, it will be shared because you're on the budget and finance. Yeah, I'm on the budget and finance yeah. committee, and we've been. I don't understand the, that loss of the revenue of uh, of uh, I think you said nine or ten percent, and we only had nine percent. What does that mean? We lost nine percent. People in the okay, in the so I, I we have bad accounts payable. So I'm not following where you are in the presentation right now, so I, um, I, I can't really comment on it. I don't know what and and go ahead and uh, I thought we could ask questions. I'm sorry, right? Yeah. No, re reform your no, no, you can ask questions, I just don't have right. an answer for you. Yeah, I can answer that particular question. And that is that um, that 10% drop was largely a function of conservation by uh, the members in our district. And it was actually something that we on the Budget and Finance Committee were sort of surprised by. And Rick Rogers called around and it was actually kind of a regional thing that uh, both uh, Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz uh, saw the same about 10% drop in consumption. And so that's that's the main thing is that our our ratepayers are are too good at, at conserving. <laughs> we lost in consumption, so we lost in revenue. Yes. Oh, be darn. Okay, well, none of these that'll make any sense, so I'll let it go. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Virginia Wright. I live in Felton from 258 Circle Drive, and I want to thank you for serving. And I want to thank the presenter for clarity. I thought it, I, it was really nice to see something that was so clear, clearly presented with expertise by the consultants and other folks on the, the board who understand how water works um, nationally and especially in California, because I don't think we can make these decisions without being in the context how it usually works in other places. It's just, we're in a very bad situation. Water's becoming more expensive. And that's just where we are. And, and so I'm basically wanted to thank you. And I did a question because I'm curious about the presentation, which is there was an increase in the revenue for the water use, but there was also an increase in the wastewater revenue. And I wondered if those were two separate line items in the bill or those are the same. Like, what's the, how does that impact the billing? Because some people pay for wastewater and some people just pay for water. I, I didn't say. There's only there's only 56 homes that pay for wastewater. There are only I'd, I'd like Kendra to address that question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so we have um, a portion of our customers and Bear Creek Estates that pay um, for wastewater services, and it's about it's 56 homes. So, um, so that homes. that is completely separate from your water bill. Um, only 56 customers receive that wastewater charge. Okay, so those yeah. folks would have to double their yeah that, that that's specific to those 56 customers yeah thanks again okay thank you so that presentation was not wastewater huh there was two parts it was water and then wastewater they were combined on the study yes, yes. well parts of it were at the i mean did you say yes they were combined on the study there was there was a presentation tonight. Part of it was water. Part of it was wastewater. Were the numbers based on the wastewater and the water? I can't be too difficult. Numbers. Did the study include I, wastewater? Yes, there was a wastewater section and a they and a freshwater section, and they had separate numbers for each. Didn't have any numbers. <laughs> they didn't have any numbers. Very uh, few numbers. Um, Another. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Tom Fredericks. I'm a ratepayer in Felton. And I wanted to, um, kind of like Bob Fultz, I keep track of things for a very long time, almost obsessively. And I kept our last Al American bill, I think that was 2013, um, it was $196 15 months. <clears throat> 
And um, right now our water bill is just over a hundred for one month. Just to say that in Felton, um, we've just after 14 years have become equal with the other rate there in Boulder Creek in the uh, San Lorenzo Valley. And uh, for me, I love remembering this because when you talk about 9% for five years to address unbelievable capital improvements needed like the pipelines and the CZU fire and the damage in 2023, I think, oh my God, just 9% can get us there. It's like five years from now, we'll be paying like just under uh, another 50% of what I'm paying now. Um, I'm very grateful. It sounds very reasonable. And as a fellow resident, compared to Cal American, it's a miracle. I want you to know what I'm thinking every time I look at my water bill. Thank you. Um, not seeing anybody else uh, right now think here in the audience directly. I'll turn it to uh, um, virtually uh, Jim Mosier. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Jim Mosier. I live in Felton. I'm a longtime resident of the San Lorenzo Valley. Um, and I first want to uh, echo what Virginia Wright said, which is that I so appreciate the hard work of the five of you working on this issue. It's complicated. We're facing a lot of crises. Um, and uh, I, just, uh, I just appreciate you taking the time in your lives to help the, dis help the district and help uh, San Luis Valley address this crisis situation that we're in. Um, I, my question or comment is that, as I understand it, Reptelis has essentially combined operation and capital expenses in their uh, model, um, and that Bob Fultz feels that those need to be carefully separated. And I wonder whether that is a real, uh, whether there is an actual uh, clear line between the two. And what makes me wonder about that is we just spent $13 million, or we are spending $13 million in capital expenses. Now we're spending um, a, a lot of, uh, uh, we have projected a lot of work to do to recover from the fire and from the floods. And my impression looking at what is actually being done in the field is that a lot of what we're classifying as capital actually has a pretty major impact on operating. So that the idea that we have to um, be careful about how the operating expenses go up is um, got to be tempered by the fact that we understand that when we're doing so much recovery uh, that, of course, operations cannot keep up uh, as if everything was static. Uh, just thinking about the environmental department, for example, much of what the environmental department does uh, right now is provide um, a, lot of, um, a lot of work for the capital improvements because we have to get, the, we have to get environmental approvals and do a lot of work uh, to make sure that the permits are issued. None of that is reflected in the capital budget um, so that those that staff is working on capital, even though they're not being charged to capital. So I think uh, I, I just would like a comment uh, about why we uh, about this issue of how we separate operation from capital. Um, I also would uh, urge the board to consider how we can support low-income people. It looks like we're going to have a significant increase. How do we help low-income low housing? I mean, low-income households. Um, we have a low-income rate assistance program. It's very modest. Perhaps we need to look uh, at how we can expand that and make it more uh, uh, more accessible to low-income households so that they can continue to be serviced by the water district in, in light with uh, our uh, overall uh, commitment to having water as a human right. 
Um, I have just one last question. I didn't understand when I looked at the slide about reserves, it looks like in the latter years, the reserve would be well over the target. Do we need to have these rate increases be so high that we end up over the, over the um, target? So is there a way we can moderate the increases so that we're at the target, but we're not going way over it? Maybe I misunderstood the presentation. Thank you. Um, Kendra, I'll ask you to the uh, comment on separating uh, operating versus capital. Mm -hmm. So we, the, the, information we provided it is separate um mm -hmm. what can you repeat the initial question what was the um the point that uh, i believe bob was making and that jim was following up on also uh with jim saying is there the need to separate the uh capital versus the operating and and how how would we do that is what the question that i'm hearing we do it every budget well, don't you capitalize some of the expenditures that, that yeah. you know, operating personnel? Correct. Yeah. And yeah. if anyone, yeah. if our crew spends time on mm -hmm. actual construction or Garrett yeah. does his engineering right. work, we do yeah. capitalize those costs as part of the total construction. Appropriately so. Do we know if Raf Tellis um, saw Which? how that works in your in your materials you gave him? I mean, our our numbers include our budgeted total overhead absor absorption costs, which is, you know, the capitalized labor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess that would maybe be a question if they capture we'll that. Uh, but I mean, it's all in the budget numbers that were provided to them. Something to explore with Ralph Ellis. Yeah, I can follow up. Um, okay. Okay. Um, additional questions from the public. I see uh, Stacy Wilbur. Right, I'm here. 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 Um, Sorry about that. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, Bear Creek Estates sewer uh, system. And I was wondering on uh, the numbers that he used. He mentioned I think 144,000 or something like that for the. Um, cost of the total expenses is that correct it's 130,000 okay 130,000 so what would you do with the other 90,000 what are the 90,000 uh I think our charge is somewhere around 325 a month times 12 months times 56 homes is 218,000. Is it that high? No, it's one that's like 173. Yeah, I didn't think it was that high. Yeah, 173,000. Yeah. Did, did you what? hear? The, the, uh, Kendra, could you? Respond yeah. to so the, the total operating re revenue for the uh, wastewater is about 173,000 annually. I'm not sure where that your other number is coming from. Okay, uh, I didn't. My monthly bill is like 370 or something like that. So okay, maybe it's is it 275 per person yeah. then. So, so the basic charge for the wastewater is uh, two fifty seven per month. So your 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 total bill also includes water charges. Right. So, so uh, what's two fifty seven times twelve times fifty six homes? What's that? Um, one seventy two. So one hundred seventy four. So about one hundred seventy three thousand. Okay, and um, is that the number that he used? I thought I said 140 or something like that. We, I can just interrupt. Basically, what we are doing here is we are building up the reserves so that you are 
collecting enough funds in your reserves to be able to meet that big expense that we showed in 2031. So you can see how your reserves are building up here on this chart. You are collecting more than what you need in terms of your total expenses. And that is being put aside in the reserves. And then when you hit that big ex expense in 2031, the reserves will be drawn down to meet that expense. So how much do we have in reserve now? Um, I can yeah. get back to him. Okay. On that. Yeah. Yes. It, it sounds like your question, Stacy, you're very specific, and yeah. Kendra's agreed that she could get back to you with um, that that's on for the Bear Creek Estates wastewater system and the expenses on that. So I'd like I'd like to I'd like to move on to uh, other public comments at this point. Um, Elena Lang. Hi, Elena Lang, Boulder Creek. I just want to, um, you know, to echo what, echo what Jim Moger said about thank you so much about this presentation and all the work that went into this. And um, uh, I did. I was shocked to see that since 2016 that the sewer system's been in in violation of that that wastewater um, discharge. So I. <laughs> Um, hopefully you're spending some money over there and you guys talked about being able to get some grants um, for that possibly. And I just really wanted to, you know, even though we're doing rate increases, encourage you to continue going for grants, you know, Santa Clara Valley Water, they got since June uh, 2020, so a little over a year, 29 million they've received. They applied for 350 and there's 157 that they million that they have pending. So um, the money's out there, especially for water districts like you guys. So, um, you know, uh, please um, keep applying and uh, thank you for all you guys' work. Thank you. Um, I see no other uh, members of the public right now to comment. Um, so I'd like to go uh, back to the board for the final round of a couple, Bob. Yeah, a couple quick things. I want to make sure that it's really clear why I'm separating operating from capital. So revenue minus expenses gives you margin, operating margin, right? And the operating margin is what you can use for capital projects. Those capital projects can either be funded out of that money or you can take out debt and then that money, your margin, goes to pay off the debt, right? And so that's why you need to have a very clear understanding of what your operating margin is. So and your non-operating margin, so that you can understand what kind of debt load you can take or what kind of capital you need to be spending. According to the numbers I put together, we need to be spending about uh, six million a year, five to six million a year in capital. Our current operating margin is three, so we are falling further behind every year because we aren't spending enough even to catch up on the decades of unfunded maintenance that we've we've done. That's number one. Number two, I want to remind folks that the last two rate increases were sold to the community exclusively around capital improvement projects, which is a very laudable thing to talk about. The reality of what happened, because there was no committed budget by the board at that time guaranteeing where the money was going, two-thirds of the excess revenue every year, that is the increase from one year to the next, Two thirds of that went to operating expenses. Only one third of the excess, excess money went to capital projects. To me, that's reversed. It should be at least two thirds, one third, two thirds capital, particularly given the fact that we have huge unfunded uh, maintenance on a number of areas, including our steel tanks, which every year continue to deteriorate because they're well outside their maintenance window. So when it comes time to vote, and this budget is informing that the community needs to be very careful and think of themselves as owners, not customers, because you have the right to vote in this. And if that operating margin isn't going towards capital and isn't going to support the capital projects we need, we need to vote it down and try again. Um, other comments or questions from board? Jamie? 
Jeff? No. Uh, Gail? I, I guess I would just respond to Bob, but again, this is kind of off track of the topic that we're on tonight. And, and also, um, I think he's kind of focusing on the past and what's happened with previous boards. But in fact, he was a member of a previous board and this board. Uh, and I think I'm out. Board. I was not, I was not a member of the previous board that did I, the previous I, rate increase. I, 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 I know, but, but you were, you've I, been on the board now for uh, two terms. And I'm, all I'm saying is I think. Said this, I, I am pushing for, this well, is the time. Uh, well, this um, is the time. Okay, it is my turn to speak. You've had plenty of time to speak. So I think you can listen to me for just a minute. Um, my my point is is simply this. I think there's nobody in this room that disputes that we need to spend a lot of money on capital improvements. And of course we have to repair all the things due to CZU fire and the storms. And many of us campaigned in 2020 and 2022 exactly on this. So uh, I think in a sense, you're preaching to the choir, trying to make it sound like the, this board is not concerned about the need for devoting money to capital projects. I think we saw that, for example, that that devotion to that when we agreed that the CZU uh, fire surcharge was made into a restricted fund. And I would just simply point out that again, we're talking about the budget tonight, it or the the. Uh, Find, then the financial plan that will uh, tell us what to do for the rate study. There's nothing to stop us when we start constructing uh, the rates to actually make it specific that certain amounts of money are spent on capital projects. We know, for example, that um, I think Santa Cruz has uh, basically a capital project surcharge that they charge on everything. Marin has a certain percentage of their rates that, that go to this. So I, I feel like you're kind of fighting a straw man here because this is it's a discussion that would happen later and it's not something that I'm gonna oppose you on um, when we try to make sure that we spend um, as a, a significant amount of our money on capital projects. You know, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. But I have to say, the last budgets that have been passed, and with your approval of this, the operating expenses continue to go up that basically consume the entire amount of the rate increase or, or substantial portions of it. And until we get a handle on that, we are limited in how much money we can borrow or how much money we can spend on capital. If that 9% is being consumed entirely by operating expenses, which based on the reserve number seems to be what it is, we can't get ahead. And that's what I'm trying to communicate here tonight relative to the presentation that's been made. Um, I, I know we all wanna spend more on capital, but our behavior around the budgets, the last two or three budgets has not been around that, not been putting us on a path to attenuate the growth in operating expenses so that we can put more money into, into capital. And until we do that, we're just on a hamster wheel. Okay. Mr. P Mr. President, can I, can I? Yes, please. A word? So I'm showing on the screen right now, what is the net? You're not I, showing us anything on the screen, Sudair? I, I'm Most. not showing my screen again. No. Just a sec, it probably, we see you. Uh, sorry. So right here, this is the net revenue that shows our rate revenue minus all, all the revenues minus the operating expenses. And you can see that every year we are putting aside close to $4 million, actually goes up to five, six, seven, eight million dollars $8 And then this money is used to pay for the debt service that we incur in issuing new debt and for capital expenses going forward. What's the percentage increase in operating expenses every year? I think it is 4% here, 4.6%. Okay, historically we've 4 .3, been doing- 4.4, you know, basically about 4.5%. 4 
Okay, you... so that so that would be really good because historically we've been running at about seven since 2013 till now. It's been about seven percent. In the last rate increase, the operating margin was set. The operating uh, excuse me expenses were set at about 3.5 percent, which would have been okay, except we doubled them because no committed budget was part of the Prop 218 process. And once we had the money, we could spend it any way we wanted. And we need to not do that either. So this is an improvement. I'm looking forward looking forward to getting this. Okay. Um, Sudhir, I think we've given you input this evening. Um, Kendra, uh, other things to... There's another presentation of this next week, a week from today. Um, is it the same presentation that we're going to see next week for anybody else that hasn't been here? Are you updating this based on any of what we've said here? Uh, well, What's your plans? We, we have shown you a couple of scenarios on the water side and three scenarios on the wastewater side. The presentation would basically be the same presentation mm -hmm. because we're not looking at rates as yet. Right. Unless okay. we decide which financial scenario you would like to proceed with. So in under the water scenario, we have got two different CIP, whether we go with the $25 million CZU project list or we go with the above below ground or the right. buried pipeline with the $52 million CIP. So those are the two options that we have for water. Right. But my question is, it's the same presentation next week that we're doing. It's the same presentation. Yes, if we do okay. not make any decision regarding you know, what we right. want to do with these scenarios, then we would have the same presentation next week. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what I expect we're going to see is similar, the same next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, well, with that, I'd like to conclude uh, this item and move on then, uh, since we have no motion on this, to the next item on our agenda this evening, um, and that's the uh, compensation study request for proposals. So, thank you all, and I think we'll sign off. Thank you, Sudhir. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Bye bye. Ready, Mark? Yes. Okay. On May 18, 2023, the board adopted addendum number one to the memorandum of understanding the management supervisor confidential and classified employee units. The addendums provide for a complete and comprehensive salary benchmark study conducted by a qualified consultant within six to 12 months of the effective date of the addendums, which are attached. Staff has uh, prepared a draft uh, request for proposal uh, for the addendum uh, for review uh, to move ahead and solicit bids. Uh, staff is recommending that the board of directors authorize the release of the request for proposal for a compensation study. That's it. Okay. All right. Um, then um, I don't believe that anybody on the board, none of the none of the committees, have uh, put this together. That is correct. Okay. All right. Uh, well, then um, why don't we start with Gail? Uh, for any comments or questions on this um, RFP. Um, I didn't really have any comments other than the fact that there's obviously a lot of dates that are wrong that need to yes. be adjusted and fixed. Um, but other than that, um, I didn't really have any comments. And, and we probably need to think about trying to expedite this, I hope. So um, I, perhaps uh, our legal counsel or whoever can tell us like what's the minimum time we have to post this so that we can move forward and okay um uh, so i would i would ask when you're going through the process to get this out and 
revised dates. If you yes. can check with it. Obviously, the dates check are with Barbara. Uh, all need to be adjusted for when this goes out. Um, I, are, I am waiting to hear back from um, the union to make sure that they didn't have any comments uh, uh, on this RFP. And you know, we want to make sure that I understand Gail's um, concerns about moving this along because we are a little late. Um, uh, Josh was one of the employee representatives that was working on this. So that the loss of Josh kind of slowed things up a little bit, but we're trying to get back on track. But I want to make sure that we have enough of a proposal time so we get qualified firms and, and get multiple firms to bid on this proposal. Okay. All right. Okay. Bob? Yeah, you know, these, I, I'm pretty cynical about these things because it tends to be a round robin ratcheting uh, effect on, on doing these, depending on who actually gets examined as, as comparisons. I, I'm also concerned, I didn't see any, even though the title of this is benchmark, I didn't see actually any benchmarking analysis that was part of the requirements in the proposal. So I'm not exactly sure what benchmarking is proposed to. Um, to be done. I don't know if that has to do with um, function or productivity or any other measurement. It's, it, I just don't know. It's completely silent on it. So um, I, I, I'm not sure I'd really call it a benchmarking study because it looks to be more of we're just going to find jobs that are somewhat similar and that's basically the end of the benchmark, um, which that, that's really not much of an analysis. I did find it interesting. It had been a while since I looked at this that virtually every employee has their own job classification. I was like, wow, that's that's a really fascinating thing. 32 job classifications with 37 full-time employees. Now, I'm sure some of these job classifications may be open um, that not have anybody in them, but it's still a tremendous number of job classifications for a district our size. Is there any way to simplify this? Um, you know, to make it a little bit more flexible. Um, yeah, so, um, and the last thing is, I have no bloody idea how we can possibly go into a Prop 218 process over the holidays without this being completed, because this is a fairly major element of the cost structure I'm highly skeptical about 4% increases on um, operating expenses, but if the board would commit to that um, with a five-year budget, then maybe we can run with it. Um, but but without this information, I think that 4% number is is can't be supported. So I, yeah. Um, for the purposes of releasing this RFP, uh, can we have a discussion about schedules at the next meeting when we talk about this? Because I really want to understand what the pro forma schedule is for this with the adjustments, given what the schedule is with the rate increase. We, we can't do the rate increase, in my opinion, without having this complete. Because this factors directly into the cost. Um, and I understand what you're saying on that. But can we have that discussion at the next board meeting? But, Not that you understand it. Can we discuss it? Uh, but I want to talk about this motion that's in front of us because I want to get this going. Um, I don't know that they know, staff knows at this point, when we're going to be able to complete the um, the rate study aspects. Well, there's if a you're, schedule out there. If you're saying that, well, we have to have this done, before we can do a rate study. I'm not ready to, to say that at this point yet. I don't know. If you're looking at under your model, 94% of, of the costs are fixed costs and a major component of that's being left out of the analysis. Okay, well, and, then, and then the last yeah. thing is 10% on proposed fee. I, I Basically, we talk that we wanna be cost conscious and yet the message that we send to the world is we don't care about costs. If only 10% of the evaluation criteria is the proposed fee. I, 
I, I agree with Bob on that. And, and actually, that brings up the one thing I did, the thing I noticed. Uh, sorry to sort of pop in here. Okay. Yeah. It was that um, I thought 30% for the executive summary. I mean, basically, that just is like how well you could, somebody can write. Um, I, I would I would shift a lot of that over to the the cost um, myself because I, I think it I think it matters. Um, I, I would disagree with Bob that that we need this for the rate study and and the reason I disagree with him is that um, I mean there's there's a there's a valid question of whether the four percent is uh, is the correct assumption and that was something that I would have asked tonight but we got off on other things. Um, I, I, and I think the reason is, is because the MOU actually limits um, the rate at which any of the salaries can be adjusted if it turns out that any of them are severely out of whack. And, and I actually went through the exercise of sort of trying to figure out like how big of an impact could this have on how much we spend on salaries? And, and it's because of that limit. It, it, which we negotiated, it, it is not. It is not such that it would actually just blow up the number, and it would, be, and you you couldn't do the rate study. Uh, at least that was my assessment when I calculated the amounts that things potentially could go up. Okay, um, Rick, do you have this? Are are you the author for this RFP? Uh, it was a combination of, of the management team, but we can adjust the percentage numbers to significantly increase yeah. and the lower. weighting for the um, the cost. The cost. Can, can yes. we just can we just have meets requirements, experience, cost? Um, I don't know, forty, twenty, forty, or something. Yeah. To, I mean, to simplify the, the sim much yeah, simpler. I mean, yes. this is a lot of overhead for something that's what and we're also telegraphing what they need to come in at at the number, yes. which I find interesting. But yeah, I mean, it's this is way too complex for them. Mm -hmm. Can we do that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeff. Okay. Two nets. Um, on. Paragraph D, firm qualifications, team organization experience, and certifications. Second paragraph under that heading, uh, you obviously picked up some cut and paste uh, copy from some other project because it talks to is working with related to grant recovery projects or water systems, and this has nothing to do with grant recovery. And then same sort of thing uh, in the next Paragraph, staff qualifications, third line toward the end there with disaster recovery operations. Again, there's nothing about disaster recovery here. So these are obviously cut and paste from some prior RFP. Sorry, can I get an answer to the benchmarking question I had, which is what benchmarking is going to be done? I, I... Sure. Yeah. What is I the do. benchmarking that's being done in this? I don't have an answer for that. Well, um, should it even be referenced as a benchmark? Well, actually, study? a staffing study, you would want to do yes. benchmarking if you were actually doing a real one. The last one we did was basically a wish list um, situation. Um, and that was because no benchmarking was done. It was just adopted whatever the wish list was. It just went in. There was no benchmarking to justify or back up why that was valid. I, I don't see anything here that will result in anything different. Okay, but I, I got my answer. Thank you. Um, does bring up a question. But let me I'm, finish. I'm done. Jamie. I mean, I I am of the opinion that um, we do need to address the question of benchmarks. Maybe it doesn't need to be done in the context of the RFP, um, but I don't know where else it would be done. If it's not in here, it won't get done. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with that. It should be... Uh, and, and 
we'll look into that uh, a little better and, and see what what the group thinking was. Something something from the consultants to tell us how they would do the benchmark. Yeah, and have the consultant and uh, describe how they the benchmark. benchmark yeah. positions. Yeah. Show yeah. us show us how you would do this. Do we know who the consultants are to ask? I mean, we're doing an RFP here. Why would they tell us that? And they're not going to increase the scope of work if they're not going to get paid for it. It'll be part of the proposal. Um, any other? Um, the RFP mentions th this ad hoc team. Uh, kind of jumps into that. Who who is that? The employee, the it's the employee representatives, um, myself, uh, and me. And what? Yeah, it's listed. Right. I, I saw the I saw the list. I was just wondering. Yeah, I, and I don't know that was the right terminology, the right terminology to use but, the ad hoc committee because it was never been established. But that's been the committee that's worked through okay. uh, the MOU negotiations. So, um, yeah, I, I saw that too and kind of thought that that it, probably wasn't um, the right term because that... So it, it's an internal... Uh, internal working group. Working group of staff that's mm -hmm. that's doing this. Okay. Right, and legal counsel. Uh, who uh, who evaluates the proposals and then makes... Who evaluates the proposals? Um, that would be that group. That group, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're giving uh, the unions, yes, buy, say, or buy into that's uh, the which of the consultants, the, the union, and okay. the uh, management, the representatives, and legal, okay. all the way through. And um, the legal counsel is uh, designated as part of the negotiations okay. with the district. And Who's our who's the management representative? Yeah. Uh, me, me and legal counsel. The district manager and legal counsel. General manager. Okay. For you mean the management group? Yeah, for the that manager. was uh, Josh, James, oh. and you? No, okay, Josh and James, I guess one of the third. Okay. So, so and we so lost James. two. Yeah, we lost two of the representatives, one for classified that with Adam okay. retired. And of course, we lost Josh. So they they have some work to do to elect a new representative moving ahead. They haven't done that yet. They have not done that. Yet. So um, I have not been notified. Get further language in there on the benchmarking uh, and how that would be done. Yes. And then I agree. Waiting the uh, how we evaluate these. Uh, simplify that. It's going to be on costs. Or most of it on that. Okay. Um, then let me make a motion first, and then I'll go out for any public comments on this. Uh, I want to move that the uh, uh, draft request for proposal uh, be revised uh, based on comments received this evening from the board and uh, uh, be uh, solicited for a um, request for proposals to be submitted. Bids be solicited. Uh, is that clear enough? No. Okay. Um, you want proposals uh, submitted, not requests for proposals. Right. I want uh, to move that we uh, recommend that the draft request for proposal with, as amended with comments from the board uh, be released and that bids be solicited for a complete comprehensive uh, salary benchmark study. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, any comments from the public on this item? Seeing none here, seeing none from our virtual attendees. Uh, Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? <clears throat> yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. 
Okay. Motion passes four to one. Okay. Um, the consent agenda. Um, anybody want to comment on those? One, one item, the 8-17-23 board minutes. Adding three words to a particular line. Okay. I'd like to propose on page 26, uh, where it says Director Fultz is upset this item was not bid on. I'd like to add the words per board policy. Any objection? I don't have an objection to that. No. And Jeff and I were the other board members in attendance, so. Okay, great, thank you. I think we do need to vote on it. So I'd like to move. Oh, we need to vote on the change. Yeah, okay. I'd like to move that the change be added to the 1723 Board director minutes, uh, the words per board policy added after director Fultz is upset this item was not bid on. Uh, I'll second that. Holly, have you caught up? Is there any comment from the public? Oh, okay. Any comment? Seeing none. Uh, President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Same. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, we have no written communications, no other informational items based on that i think we can adjourn okay. thank you everybody no, 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 no.